I'm going to start just by talking about uh, why the River Thames scheme is needed. So the River Thames between Egham and Teddington um, is one of the largest areas of undeveloped floodplain in England. The stretch of river and the floodplain in the, in the area offers miles of open space opportunity. In addition to the towns and villages in this area, the landscape has been heavily shaped by major infrastructure and extensive um, mineral workings. This has resulted in the area in which many homes and businesses are at risk of flooding with a landscape which suffers from the physical constraints, meaning that open space isn't used to its full potential. There have been serious floods in this area over the, the past 100 years. Indeed, there was a significant flood that, may, that affected many properties in early January just this year. Um, many properties were impacted uh, and, uh, and affected uh, with widespread flooding in 2014, and some residents were out of their homes for more than a year. Climate um, change projections. Sorry, something's happened to my screen. Um, climate change projections estimate that that um, rainfall levels will increase by approximately 41% by the year 2050. Um, the estimated economic impact of major flooding is around 1 billion. So we need a long term sustainable plan to deal with this risk and, and overcoming restraints requires investment. So what is the River Thames scheme? So the River Thames scheme will reduce the risk of flooding while unlocking the economic health and environmental benefits of the river between Egham and Teddington, responding to the dual challenges of climate change and nature recovery. The scheme will include a new flood channel in two sections, which you can see on the screen at the moment, uh, passing through the boroughs of Runnymede and Spelthorne in Surrey, as well as the bed lowering of the River Thames just downstream of the Desborough Cut and there will be increases in capacity at three weirs along the Thames. The scheme also represents a new landscape based approach to creating healthier, more resilient and more sustainable communities. The scheme will create new areas of green blue open space with recreation facilities, connections to wildlife and provide sustainable travel connections to link communities together. Areas of new improved habitat for wildlife and nature recovery will connect existing nature sites with wildlife corridors to provide a new nature recovery network along the length of the channel that supports biodiversity. So the channel is the purple and orange bits that you can see on the screen in front of you. Um, new or improved routes for pedestrians and cyclists will run along the channel and through new public spaces, linking different elements of the scheme with communities and providing better connections within and across the area. So if we go on to the next slide. So these are our goals for the scheme. So this is how we um, set out what it is that we're trying to deliver. The Rivers Thames scheme is a forward thinking response to climate change, community needs and economic development. The scheme will reduce flood risk to 11,000 homes and 1,600 businesses and infrastructure. It will enhance the resilience of nationally important infrastructure, contribute to a vibrant local economy and maximise the social and environmental value of the river. So pause on that for a second just so you can um, read those goals. And that's in our brochure. Um, if you move on to the next slide. So I'm going to tell you a bit about this consultation. So this online event is part of the, con the statutory consultation being carried out in accordance with the Planning Act of 2008 and associated le legislation and guidance. It's part of the development consent order process, which we'll go on to explain. Um, it's, this is an important part of the planning process for our scheme. Our approach to this consultation has been developed with the relevant local authorities and is set out in a statement of community consultation, which you can find on our website. And it builds on consultation that we did back in 2022. And since then, the scheme's design has significantly advanced and it's been shaped by feedback from engagement with local communities, stakeholders and ongoing assessments. So we're now at a really important stage seeking your views on this updated design. 
and your input is really essential to refine our proposals. So we're going to be welcoming your opinions and suggestions. On the screen at the moment is some of the key ele elements of the scheme design that we're going to be um, seeking your feedback on. So we're going to be talking about these in this presentation. There's lots of information online um, and, and these in, in particular are areas that we'd um, value your input on. So if we go on to the uh, next slide. So I'm going to talk about how we get permission to build and operate the scheme, and this relates to the development consent order that I mentioned earlier. Um, so the development consent order process, which this consultation is part of, is detailed there. Now, the River Thames scheme was originally needed permission through the Town and Country Planning Act process, but in the light of the scheme being considered as nationally significant, we are now following a process set out in the Planning Act for a development consent order known as a DCO. So a DCO will give us permission to build and operate the scheme. Unlike other processes, it means we would only apply once for almost all of the different types of consents we need, including any appropriate land powers. This ensures that most scheme elements are examined, considered and granted all in one go. This ensures that most scheme elements um, this ensures that most communities are examined, considered and granted in one go. We're currently in the pre-application stage of the DCO process, which is that blue box there in the middle. So I'll just give you a few seconds again, just to then look through um, those other stages of the process. And essentially what it describes and sets out is we will go through um, ultimately to submit the DCO um, for an examination, uh, everything that we submit gets obsessed, uh, assessed and then it goes through to a final decision. So if you move on to the next slide. So this just sets out the key developments of the scheme um, since 2009, um, which was when the Environment Agency um, published and consulted on a document called the Lower uh, lower Thames flood risk management strategy. So this sets out that everything that's happened since then. Um, so and then on the, the next side of the screen, you can see the key developments um, since our last consultation in 2022. So we've used feedback from our earlier consultations, as mentioned, to help us develop the River Thames scheme. So since the 2022 consultation, We've been continuing our work to develop a scheme that provides the best balance of economic, environmental, community, technical and landowner considerations. So we've amended the alignment of the Spellthorn channel at um, Sheepwalk to provide greater benefits around the connectivity to green space, as well as to provide improvements to road junctions from Sheepwalk to Chertsey Road. And information on this um, realignment can be found in, in a document called the Preliminary Environmental Impact Information Report, which is PEER, is it known? We've updated our hydraulic model. Um, we've continued to develop our landscape and green infrastructure uh, design, um, uh, and that includes additional recreational features within the scheme and an active travel um, non motorised footpath cycleway route and again we'll, we'll go through some of that. Um, we've taken opportunities to create habitat for wildlife with the aim of achieving improved biodiversity and nature recovery. So key element of this development has been incorporation of priority areas of habitat development into the scheme de design. We've also engaged further with landowners along the route of, of the design, um, in particular in relation to their property. We've assessed the type of ground in the area which means for, um, uh, so we've got a better understanding for construction and operation of the scheme. And that brings us on quite nicely, I think, to the actual scheme itself. So if you go on to the next slide, please. So as I mentioned, um, the scheme is in a number of parts. And the first part is this channel, which is in two sections. And the first part of that is the Runnymede channel. So if you move on to this, um, this section of the channel 
um, is nearly three miles long. So it runs from Egham Hythe to Chertsey. And some of the key features of the scheme around this channel section include, so it'll begin um, to the north of Ferry Avenue, starting from an intake structure that will include a water level control gate to the west side of the River Thames. There'll be a new green open space um, at Royal Hythe to the north of the channel at Egham Hythe. Um, the scheme proposes that the Northlands Lane woodland area of habitat along the west of the channel as it passes through the lake south of Green Lane the, and the lake south of Northlands Lane and Fleet Lane. The channel will then pass under Green Lane, Staines Road and the M3. There'll be a new blue open space there known as Penton Park is, and it's being considered to the north of Abbey Lake 1 and a new wet meadow proposed at Ab Abbey Meads. So if we move on to the next slide, so then we come on to the Spellthorn channel. Um, so this is almost two miles long. It will run from Laylam to Weybridge. So some of the key features that you can see here, the intake to the channel will be on the east side of the River Thames to the north of the M3. There'll be a flood embankment created between Littleton North Lake and the Shepparton Industrial State. There's a section of approximately 600 metres of the Spellthorn Channel at Sheepwalk that's been realigned from the proposals that we uh, presented at that um, non statutory consultation back in 2022. Um, the, the scheme proposes for a new area of habitat to be created to the north of the Shepparton Industrial Estate and a new underbridge will be created under the M3. Um, the Sheepwalk new green open space is proposed to the west um, of the channel, to the, to the uh, south of the M3. There. Um, there's a large area of open space and woodland habitat which is proposed at the east of Sheepwalk at Manor Farm. There's an area of open space with woodland and grassland habitats and two raised landforms which is proposed at the land south of Chertsey Road. Wetland areas and further areas of habitat creation are also pr proposed adjacent to the channel south of the M3. And the channel will pass through existing lakes under Thameside, Littleton Lake, the M3, Sheepwalk, Renfrey Way and then, and then Ferry Lane. So both of these channel sections, Runnymead and Spellthorn, will include a number of flow and control structures to control the flow of water through. So if you move on, I'll just talk a bit about the engineering of the channel. So the flood channel will vary in shape depending on the ground conditions or the lakes that it passes through. Um, where the channels pass through natural and made ground, um, other than waste, they'll be designed to achieve natural appearance with softer edges. These sections of the channels will be approximately 45 metres wide. Um, they'll have a depth between three to four metres and they'll retain an average water depth around two to three metres. This type of channel design will be possible along around about half a kilometre of the Runnymede channel, along about 0.2 kilometres of the Spellthorn channel. The channel passing through existing and historic landfill sites will be constructed using vertical sheet pile walls driven into the ground from the existing ground level. A water resistant layer will be installed on the channel bed to isolate the channel from the surrounding landfill. These channel sections will have a width of approximately 20 metres and they'll have a depth of approximately four metres. Again, the water depth will range from around two to three metres in normal flood conditions. The building of the channel through landfill sites will be expected along a roundabout um, 0.9 kilometres of the Runnymede Channel and approximately 1.2 kilometres of the Spellthorn Channel. Um, just an additional point to make on the construction of the channels. Um, we're using, and you'll have noticed, it goes through existing lakes. So the Runnymede Flood Channel trans traverses through the lake to the south of Green Lane, the lake to the south of Norlands Lane, Fleet Lake, Abbey Lake and the Abbey 2 Lake. And similarly, the Spellthorn Channel traverses through four existing lakes. That's Littleton North, Littleton East, Sheepwalk 2 and currently the Ferris Meadow Lake. 
By integrating these lakes into the channel design, the need for extensive hard engineering um, has been minimised. So I want to just come come on to that point in a bit more detail about the um, the Ferris Meadow Lake. So if we go on to the next slide. So as already mentioned, our proposals currently include the Spellthorn Channel passing through the Ferris Meadow Lake, and you can see that um, in the box on, on the left called option one. However, during the course of the scheme development, the lake has become used more widely for open water swimming. In light of this, uh, we got quite a bit of feedback from stakeholders. So we're currently uh, undertaking a water quality assessment of the impacts of our current alignments on Ferris Meadow Lake and an option study to understand the feasibility of possibly considering alternative alignment options for the Spellthorn Channel at this location. So the outcome of this study will be used alongside the comments received in this consultation and previous consultations to determine which option we'll take forward. Following this consultation, the completion of the option study will engage further with the public. Um, so just going to walk through the alternative options that are being considered. So the, the first option, um, as, as I've talked about, you can see on, on the left there is where the Spellthorn Channel passes through the Ferris Meadow Lake. Um, the second one um, is where the, uh, is the, the, the new the flood channel passes north Ferris Meadow Lake into the River Thames via um, what's called the, the CHAP, um, which would be a newly constructed route. If we go on to the next slide, there's uh, some of the options that have been, other options being considered. So the third option is to divert the Spellthorn Channel down the west side of Ferris Meadow Lake onto the River Thames along a newly constructed route. The fourth um, is to divide the Spellthorn Channel into two sections with half of it diverted to the north via the chap and half down to the west side of the Ferris Meadow Lake, again along a newly constructed route. The fifth is a tunnel under Ferris Meadow Lake for flood flows um, with the flow from the scheme diverted into the chap via a normally constructed route. Um, I think we go on to that. Yeah, this should be uh, option six. So option six here is to retain the flood relief channel alignment through Ferris Meadow Lake, but with an augmented flow diverted into the chap via a newly constructed route. We've got two sub options to this. Sub option 6A is to consider it without a new flow construct, um, control structure at the end, and 6B to consider it with a new flow control structure. Um, so all these options and more information about these options can be found in chapter seven of our statutory consultation brochure. If we carry on. So I've spoken about the channels, I'd now like to talk about the downstream measures. So moving on to the downstream measures proposed, in addition to the new flood channel, to improve channel capacity, we are proposing to lower um, the middle of the riverbed with a stretch of the, uh, for a stretch of the River Thames that's about one kilometre in length. And that'll be from the downstream end of Devsborough Cut to just downstream of Walton Marina. By doing this, we'll create an a, an additional flow area that will allow water to pass through at a lower level, reducing the amount of water that enters into the floodplain. We're also, uh, as I mentioned before, proposing to add additional gates at Sunbury, Molesey and Teddington to create a new pathway for water at the weir complex, supporting the current gates and weirs. By using these extra gates, less water will throw through the existing gates and weirs which will in turn lower water levels upstream. With the additional weir gates, the amount of water flowing downstream will remain the same and there will be no increase in downstream flow. On screen now, you've got a diagram of the bed lowering proposals on the left that I spoke about for just downstream of Desborough Cut and the plans for the capacity improvements at the three weirs. So these images are, again are all in our consultation brochure um, and there's a supporting information Pack, which is map book volume two, which is also part of the statutory consultation, which which details these. So 
So let's, um, if we move on to the next slide, let's just talk about the impact of the channel on flood risk. As part of the uh, River Thames scheme's impact on flood risk, as I mentioned, the new flood channel re reduced the risk of flooding to 11,000 homes and 1,600 businesses. So there's a depiction of this on the histogram on the screen, and that shows the projected potential range of flood level reduction with, it, with the scheme in place. The greatest reduction in flood risk will be from Staines to Chertsey, with a potential flood level reduction of between 0.35 metres and 0.9 metres. In reference to the 2014 flooding, um, there's a notable reduction uh, in, in lev levels include downstream of Chertsey Weir, which has a potential of around 0.85 metres flood level reduction, Whitchief Lane, um, which is a 0.8 metre reduction, um, and Staines Rail Bridge, we have a potential maximum flood uh, flood level reduction of uh, over half a metre. What about the impact downstream? So we go on to the next slide. So additionally, the capacity improvements at Sunbury, Molesley and Teddington Weirs, together with the bed reprofiling downstream of Desborough Cut, will they will fully negate the um, small increase in peak flows, which arises from keeping water in the new flood channels. The implementation of these downstream measures will reduce flood risk in different sections of the River Thames. Um, as shown on the map on screen there, the bed lowering downstream of the Desborough Cut will be beneficial in reducing flood risk um, up to Shepparton Weir. Um, the installation of extra gates at Sunbury Weir um, will, will lead to a reduction in flood levels extending from Desborough, the um, Desborough bed lowering point area to Shepparton, with some actual minor positive impact upstream. Um, the introduction of extra gates at Molesey Weir will lower flood levels up to Sunbury Weir. And finally, the implementation of additional gates at Teddington Weir will further contribute um, to the reduction of flood levels extending up to Molesey Weir along the river. We go on to the next slide. So the combined impact on flood risk from the new channel and the downstream measures will significantly enhance flood resilience and will provide better protection to homes, infrastructure and the environment for the areas along the River Thames. Um, to see what the River Thames scheme's impact on flooding will look like, um, there's a schematic diagram to show how flow passing through the River Thames um, flood shell area in a 1 in 20 annual event chance um, with without River Thames in place. I'll pause on that for a moment. And then when we go on to the next slide, we we'll see a, um, a comparison again for the uh, 1 in 20 annual chance flood event with River Thames scheme in place. So that's a visual graphic of the benefits there. and more information on flooding and flood modelling um, is provided as part of the statutory consultation information in a document called flood modelling non-technical summary and uh, that's available and supported by MacBook volume one. Um, so I want to go on to talk about the um, landscape and green infrastructure and actually travel elements about the scheme. So I'm going to hand over to um, Phil Russell Vic for this. Thanks, Andrew, very much. Hello again, everybody. Um, I'm going to take you through the landscape and green infrastructure elements of the scheme. Um, firstly, just a discussion around the active travel route. Uh, as part of the landscape based approach of the River Thames scheme, a central route for active travel of around five and a half miles is proposed. The route will be fully segregated between cyclist and pedestrian users and will connect the two new primary green open spaces at Royal Hythe and Sheepwalk, which is land and also land south of Chertsey Road and the new potential blue open space at Abbey One Lake. The active travel route will comprise of multiple links to connect local communities such as Staines, Egham High, Thorpe, Laylam, Chertsey, Shepparton Green, Old Shepparton, Weybridge and Walton. The route includes the building of two new bridge crossings for non-motorised use over the River Thames, connecting Chertsey to Laylam and Desborough Island, 
to Ferris Meadow Lake, and I'll show you the locations of those in a bit more detail in a moment. Next slide, please. To fully maximise the opportunity to create a connected, high quality, new major public green infrastructure asset, the project team began in early 2022 to develop the landscape and green infrastructure design for the River Thames scheme. The process of the design work for this began with four conceptual landscape themes, as shown on the current slide, which focused on some of the key objectives of the project. The themes were put through an options appraisal process, which tested the themes against factors such as planning policies, flood risk, buildability, affordability, carbon generation, mitigation, and biodiversity and ecology. The process also involved engagement workshops with local planning authorities and special interest groups. The feedback received together with the result of the appraisal led to the development of two preferred options and two sub-options. The sub-option, rather the options were option one, a fully connected active travel route along the length, length of the scheme and two new bridges over the river. And option two, active travel provision, but without a fully connected active travel route or connections across the river. Two sub options were also identified, which provided for, by example, low key or passive uses for the open spaces, such as walking, jogging in a formal kickabout, or a more active, intensive recreational and sporting use offer, such as skating, BMX, sports pitches and adventure play. These two sub options could apply to either of the main options. It was decided that the core design under option one sub option A, that is the main active travel route with low key passive recreation uses, will be taken forward as the primary basis for the design for statutory consultation based on the stronger support these types of recreational uses received from some stakeholders. However, it's important to note that the LNGI design at this stage is schematic and it allows for further development of a range of uses. This includes adopting a wide range of recreation opportunities, such as identified by sub option B. And as part of the final landscape design, we will consider the comments received at this consultation as well as previous engagement. We just move to the next slide. So the following slides are some of our landscape and green infrastructure design plans uh, along with the along the running and Spelthorn channel sections starting at Royal Hythe. Uh, now, I haven't got a lot of time to run through this in any detail, so what I'm going to ask you to do is to look out for a number of key uh, items as we go through. The active travel route, as I previously mentioned, this runs throughout the length of the scheme, um, and we're going to look at this from a sort of north to south type basis. Look out also for the areas of land that are going to be taken into the scheme for recreation and also for habitat creation purposes. Uh, Look out also for the continual nature of the landscape space. There are two new green open spaces, but this is one very long landscape space as well. And within the new green open spaces, look out for a range of facilities identified by a series of symbols. These include items such as um, uh, cafes, toilets, parking, play space, and so on. And the plans also show in a darker blue uh, the, the channel. And so you can see from the plans the relationship, close relationship between uh, the LNGI provision uh, and the channel itself. So the first uh, 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 drawing here is Royal Hythe, uh, and that is one of our major new green open spaces. The active travel route runs from north to south through that, and you can see the channel in the darker blue, as I mentioned, uh, the southern end of that. So it's a very big new green open space of around about 40 hectares. Next one, please. And this is an image of that artist's impression looking down the length of the scheme, looking from north to south. So it's a bird's eye view looking on the length of that new green open space, the active travel route in the middle and the, and the channel in the far distance in that view. Next one. Moving along the scheme to the south, the channel continues to run alongside uh, the Norlands Lane landfill site. It crosses Green Lane, it crosses Norlands Lane itself, the road that is, and then flows into the uh, Thorpe Park lakes. Next, please. This is the sort of uh, view and image that I think we would have of the active travel route as it runs alongside the channel itself, showing the sorts of treatments, landscape treatments alongside the channel, uh, and also the nature of the bridges, which are all generally speaking at grade rather than being raised. In any great height above 
uh, the level of the channel itself. Next one, please. So moving down the scheme, we're now uh, moving down uh, alongside uh, the A320 that runs um, from uh, Staines down into Chertsey. Thorpe Meadow Lakes, uh, Thorpe Park Lakes are on the left hand side of the drawing. Uh, Abbey One Lake, where we're proposing a new blue open space is in the middle of the drawing and the active travel route runs diagonally across the drawing, uh, getting to Ferry uh, Avenue uh, on the bottom right hand corner of that drawing. Next one, please. And here is an image of uh, the active travel route as it passes along the southern part of uh, Leyland Golf Course adjacent to the Abbey Lakes and as I said moving along towards uh, the uh, uh, to Ferry Lane. Uh, sorry, yes, to Ferry Lane there in the distance. Thank you. Next one. And then beyond Ferry Lane, uh, we move into the Abbey Meads area, an area where the levels will be reduced, uh, where the scheme will actually be effectively a spillway. Uh, before the scheme uh, re-enters the channel uh, in the vicinity of the M3 and Chertsey lock. Now, this drawing also shows the location of one of the two bridges, that uh, brown bridge symbol on the river there uh, that would link uh, the Abbey Meads area uh, across to Laylam and uh, the vicinity of uh, Thameside. Next one, please. And this shows uh, an image of uh, the scheme running alongside Abbey Meads. And if you're really, really uh, got good eyesight, you may just see um, the proposed bridge in the far distance. Next one, please. Uh, this shows the Littleton Lake complex. Uh, the active travel route actually runs along the uh, south side of the M3 uh, and then enters into the Sheep Walk uh, New Green Open Space area. Next one. And the there's a picture of the sort of idea we might have for one of the bridges, um, a single column cable stay type structure over the river. And again, shows some of the enhancements alongside the, um, the Thames uh, path side and some of the cycle options that we are looking to uh, to put in place. Next one, please. So this is the Sheep Walk uh, main uh, new green open space, uh, closely, associated to, closely associated to the channel with uh, the M3 to the north of it. Next, please. And here's a, uh, another aerial uh, looking al along the length of the active travel route across the sheep walk area, the M3 obviously on the left-hand side of the image. Next, please. Uh, the, the scheme then and the channel go into the land to the south of Chertsey Road, uh, just to the southwest of Old Shepparton, uh, where there will be further open space. Next, please. Uh, so this is the channel uh, running under uh, Chertsey Road and where, where it joins with Renfrey Way. Old Shepparton is off to the left hand side of this image. It shows the, the general nature of the channel as it runs through that land and the landscape proposals that will go along with it. Uh, this is a uh, Manor Farm, which is a little to the east of uh, the, uh, the main part of the scheme. It's an area that we're taking in primarily for habitat creation rather than access opportunities. Next, please. And this is part of the sheep walk uh, uh, scheme showing the uh, facilities and the service that uh, new green open space uh, closely associated with the channel itself. Next, please. And then uh, this shows uh, Ferris Meadow Lake uh, with the anti travel route coming on the left hand side of the drawing and bridging over between Ferris Meadow Lake and Desborough Island. Uh, so this will be the second of our two new bridge options. And there are habitat creation proposals, including in New Wetland to Desborough Island and to the land to the south of uh, Desborough Cut between Desborough Cut and uh, uh, Engine River. I think the last one for me. And there's an aerial view of it. So right in the middle of that drawing, you can see the new bridge over the River Thames uh, and uh, the Desborough Cut to the south of that to show that how that all links up and how the active travel will then link across the Desborough Cut and into uh, the existing uh, Thames Park as it runs into uh, into Walton. OK, I'm going to hand back, uh, hand over to Gary at this point. Thanks, Phil um, and Andrew, who have kind of described some of the work we've got to do, some of the construction work, and it will involve 
uh, the excavation of large volumes of materials and waste. Now, we plan to reuse and recover significant amounts of this material and waste within the scheme and where it's required for the scheme design. Um, where we've got to take that material off site, we need to use the uh, or utilize the waste hierarchy to determine um, if it can be put to beneficial reuse or recovery before utilizing disposal really as a last resort. Um, using uh, material and waste within the scheme to achieve the design has a sustainability benefit. Uh, it helps reduce construction traffic, air quality, noise impacts, and reduces the overall carbon footprint and material demands on the wider aggregate and construction markets. Um, the waste hierarchy, hierarchy, which prioritizes how waste is managed is embedded with UK legislation. Um, it's at the heart of our approach on the River Thames scheme. Uh, we need to adhere to all relevant legislation and guidelines. I guess any materials and waste set out for reuse or recovery uh, will be managed through suitable mechanisms. On screen now are examples of the plans for treatment and storage, as well as potential areas for waste recovery and placement of materials. More detail on materials management can be found in the consultation brochure, as is everything you've seen today. It's all in the consultation brochure. We move on to our construction principles um, for the River Thames scheme. Uh, it's a major project of national significance, and we recognise there'll be impacts during construction. Um, it's important to us we prioritise being considerate constructors, minimising disruption to the community, and prioritising safety, the environment, and respect for our residents throughout the construction process. Uh, we expect construction to run from mid-2026 till the early 2032, um, with the flood channel operation from the early 2030s. It's expected the main construction works will take around four years to complete, and we anticipate most of the construction work would take uh, place between Monday to Friday, and take place during daylight normal working hours, eight till six. Um, some construction activities will potentially require weekend working or working across uh, seven days a week or uh, 24 hours. To help reduce the impacts of the construction noise, we'll take steps such as timing construction and minimize work outside of normal working hours, if that's possible. During construction, uh, there'll be a need for a series of temporary site compounds. Uh, locations have been considered for two main compounds, including Royal Hyde and Sheepwalk and or Manor Farm. Uh, these compounds, these are the main compounds, and they'll be approximately 2,500 square metres in size and may be combined with temporary materials processing and storage sites. When we start construction, there'll be uh, traffic for our vehicles and workers, which might put extra pressure on the local highways. To manage this, uh, we will plan specific routes for our construction traffic to follow, and where possible, we'll avoid local high net highway networks uh, by creating temporary haul roads uh, through the working areas. These routes will be designed to have the least impact on local highways, and we'll have dedicated access to mainly A roads uh, where we can. Um, again, more information on our construction principles can be found in the brochure uh, for statutory consultation and the PEER, which is the Preliminary Environmental Information Report, both of which are on the website. Uh, the next one should be environmental effects. Um, so we're obviously focused on maximising the environmental benefits of the River Thames scheme and minimising the, the negative effects. Um, with a robust and compliant assessment framework and strategic mitigation measures, the River Thames scheme uh, can set to be a catalyst for ecological advancement. Uh, the PEER, or the Preliminary Environmental Info Information Report, plays a crucial role in shaping how the River Thames scheme uh, develops by presenting our preliminary assessment of the scheme's likely significant effects. Um, these assessments are framed in the, a, a kind of reasonable worst case scenario, which is a precautionary measure when taken uh, when design, construction um, or baseline information is just not complete yet, um, such as um, when additional surveys or design work is needed. 
uh, the scheme of this size will inevitably have some potential negative impacts, mostly during the construction phase, but also when in uh, operation. And these are set out in the peer, which you can review as part of the consultation. Um, we're proactively addressing these issues. That's the whole point of trying to identify them now uh, by developing and implementing mitigation measures to effectively manage and minimise these effects um, to ensure they remain uh, within acceptable levels. Construction activities will be temporary and are expected to last for approximately six years. Activities will be phased to reduce the impact of any single location. Our next slide is uh, working with landowners. Um, and while the scheme brings benefits to communities, uh, many land interests within the scheme boundary will have different needs and will need to be uh, will be concerned about how the scheme might or may affect them. Uh, for different land areas, the scheme may require different powers, uh, such as but not limited to buying the land outright, known as freehold acquisition, acquiring rights over the land or temporarily using the land during just for construction period only. Um, of course, we're committed to obtaining all interests uh, inland um, by private agreement where possible. However, in the event that negotiations with land trusts are unsuccessful, uh, we will seek to work with our compulsory powers in the application for the development consent order to help us deliver the scheme. Uh, statutory consulta uh, compensation will be payable uh, where needed to acquire interests inland. As part of the consultation, uh, we've written to everybody uh, that we've identified as having an interest in land to let them know about the consultation and ask them to share their views. Uh, we're going to consider their feedback along with everybody else's and continue working with those landowners following this consultation. Uh, it helps us refine our proposals in the light of all the feedback we received, and then we'll be in a better place to submit our application to the planning inspectorate. Uh, moving on is we want your feedback. Um, genuinely, please get involved and share your feedback about the proposals uh, for the River Thames scheme. A consultation runs till the 4th of March this year. And it's a really important, uh, actually critical step in the River Thames scheme. All your feedback is important to us uh, and you will be carefully considered um, to help shape the proposals going forward. So you can share your uh, thoughts and consultation feedback by completing the online uh, consultation form or the hard copy. Uh, and the uh, ways you can do that are on the screen now. Uh, once the consultation is closed on the 4th of March, um, we'll review all the feedback we've received. Um, and the feedback will be used to produce a consultation report, which will summarize the findings of how feedback has been considered and show how the feedback has uh, informed any changes we then make to the, the proposals for the River Thames scheme. How you can find out more, there's lots more information um, on the next slide. Um, uh, you can take a note of the following ways in which you can find out more about the River Thames scheme uh, on the screen now. Uh, our social media is there if you, you have social media. Um, that will have links to our website, which is the main portal for information. Everything you've seen today uh, is on the River Thames Scheme website and can be accessed there. And of course, if you want to reach out and get in contact with us, there are email addresses and contact phone numbers. If you have a question uh, after today's event or you can't make one of the in-person events. If we move on to the next slide, we'll just look at the in-person events. If you do have time and you want to try and get along and talk to people in person, um, you're very welcome to come along. All the dates are on there, um, quite small writing. Uh, they are on our website though. Uh, you can see all um, 11 face-to-face -face events. The first one has taken place um, in Egham, Chertsey tomorrow, followed by Shepparton. So do come along if you, you want to talk to some of the team uh, on a more one-to-one -one basis or spend a bit more time looking at the documents. I'll just leave those on screen for a few seconds just so you can have a look and see if any of them work for you. And this is the section now where we'll move on to questions. So 
we've given you a lot of information, uh, my colleagues. Now I know some of you have been putting questions in the chat. Some of you will be writing your questions down and thinking, but this is a good moment now for questions. And my Jacob's colleagues will let us know who the first call, uh, questions are coming from. <laughs> 